John Hume has died at the age of 83. He said, politics is the alternative to war. Political commentators Alex Kane and McFilty uh, joining us this morning. Good morning to you, Alex. Morning, Stephen. Hi, good, good morning, Mick. Morning, Stephen. What are your thoughts, Mick? Well, it's a passing of an era, I think. Uh, I think it's hard to... It's really hard to overstate Hume's... Or, you know, without trying to canonise him, Hume's influence not simply on the passing of history, but really the shaping of the future. I mean, he began as really part of that new Catholic middle class that would take not take no for an answer. And I think that was based on ambitiousness. He believed in another and a better world. And not only in the abstract big picture, he fought tooth and nail for the people of Derry. And latterly, as he got uh, greater power and influence, particularly at the European Parliament, um, for the whole of the North West and ultimately for Northern Ireland. He had huge faith in people and in the goodness of people. And he delivered against the sceptics within unionism, as you heard uh, David Trimble rather uh, openly admitting that he had to change his view of Hume, but also nationalism and that form of nationalism that turned to the gun before turning to negotiation. And his legacy is what he promised all along and what many of us didn't ever believe we could have, which is an agreed Ireland. I think his legacy is going to be very difficult for any future leaders of nationalism or unionism uh, to get to the future without uh, accepting the fruits of the life's work of John Hume. And, and, you know, in some of the things that you played this morning, I think one of the most abiding things is that he understood violence not as an interplay between two different communities but as a contagion between one community ripping that community in two needlessly um, and I, I think today is a moment for real reflection I think not, not simply on the on the legacy of Hume but actually what it means for us to continue that legacy well into the future. Uh, we've just got a, a statement uh, from Tony Blair uh, former Prime Minister has said John Hume was a political titan, a visionary who refused to believe the future had to be the same as the past. His contribution to peace in Northern Ireland was epic and he will rightly be remembered for it. He was insistent it was possible, tireless in pursuit of it and endlessly creative in seeking ways of making it happen. Beyond that, he was a remarkable combination of an open mind to the world and practical politics. In any place, says Mr Blair, in any party, anywhere, he would have stood tall. It was good fortune that he was born on the island of Ireland. Tony Blair, Blair con concludes, I was fortunate to work with John on the Good Friday Agreement, but also to get to know him years before. He influenced my politics in many ways, but his belief in working through differences to find compromise will stay with me forever. My thoughts are with Patricia and the rest of his family. He will be greatly uh, missed. What is the extent of the political risk, Alex Kane, that John Hume took? Um, I, I, I think people forget that the, the, the huge thing about John Hume is that he realised right from the beginning, and uh, David touched upon it, David Trimble touched upon him, I mean, John was one of the final few people who actually sat in the old storm in Parliament. And this was a man who knew, who knew that old nationalism wasn't ever going to work again. I mean, uh, most people of this generation wouldn't even remember who Eddie McAteer was, the key nationalist figure in Northern Ireland. He's totally forgotten about. Hume also recognised that violence, Republican violence, wasn't going to work. The, the, the 62 or the 56 to 62 border campaign, that sort of violence wasn't going to work. What Hume did, what was so extraordinary about Hume, he brought in a new way of thinking. That, that, that ability to say, look, what we were doing in the past, whether it was through violence or whether it was just doing nothing at all, sitting twiddling their thumbs, isn't going to work. We have to make Northern Ireland change. We can make Northern Ireland change. And it, we, we forget as well now, Stephen, you know, because it, uh, I, I think a lot of unionists still remember the fact that the anglo irish agreement annoyed them, that the, the, the talks with Gerry Adams and so on annoyed them. But Hugh changed the face, not only how nationalism did politics across Ireland, across the United Kingdom, he also changed the face of how, of how unionism 
did politics because he made them set up and take notice from Sunningdale onwards that they couldn't ever do what they had done the previous 50 years. He said to them, there is a way of doing something. You have to make change. We have to make change, but we can't. He was the original. I mean, I don't want to, as Mick said there, I don't want to over-egg it too much. I don't want to camelize him too quickly. But he was the, the originator, the begetter, the root in which the power sharing that so many of us, including people like me, have wanted to see in Northern Ireland for so long. He was the beginning of that. That's how important his legacy in Northern Ireland is. Yes, there were mistakes. Yes, I think he damaged his own party. Yes, I think he could, he could be too impatient at times with people. I had my occasion to run them with him. But yes, I cannot think of a Northern Ireland now. You know, he was, I think Tony Blair touched upon it there. He was bigger than Northern Ireland politics. He was bigger than UK. Al- he was a big, big name. Alex and Mick, maybe you can both stay there. Uh, Mick Fealty and Alex Kane still with us uh, the, 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 this morning. And there will be a whole generation now um, McFeelty, um of some of our younger listeners listening to this program, and they 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 will not realise the pivotal role John Hume played. They won't have lived through it. That's true, um, and you know, to some extent, some of these tributes will go over the heads of some of those younger people. But I I, I would say, really picking up on the point that Alistair Campbell. Made. If there's lessons, and this is why I said that Hume is as important for the future as he as he is for his record in the past. And I would say, uh, without much fear of contradiction, that no other politician or uh, no other politician's life mission in that era before these youngsters uh, really has prefigured the, the nature of the game that's come after his career has ended. That, that idea that all politicians' lives end in fa- fa- failure isn't quite true. Of Hume in the sense that, yes, his personal career came to an end and he kind of really didn't take much part in politics after the uh, the Good Friday Agreement was signed. But it was kind of leaving, not, not simply that it was leaving on a high, but actually what's come afterwards, his priorities. And again, you know, Campbell, uh, Alistair Campbell's note that he was an optimist, you know, the, the optimist is the true realist. The, the belief in man as he should be, not taking him as he actually is on a day-to-day basis is a key to understanding Hume's influence, not simply at the time back in the 70s and 80s when we're all watching, you know, especially the early 70s, watching these big arguments between Hume and Paisley and Jerry Fitt and Black and White uh, on, on the evening news, uh, but, but really about how we have to live and how we have to work this agreement that he spent his life arguing for, cajoling, Bullying when necessary. His own party, his own party colleagues, never mind uh, people on the other side. And the other thing I think is really important for those that, that younger generation to take away is really how effective he was as a public representative. This guy fought tooth and nail for Derry in a way that no public representative has come after him has even managed to um, to, uh, to get a shadow. You know, he brought. Significant parts of the Fruit of the Loom uh, expanding industry right across in the middle of the 1980s. Now, it wasn't simply him alone, but he understood that every single small opportunity you had to be on, you had to cajole, you had to connect, you had to pull people together to make things happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, uh, Alex, can remind us what the unionist reaction was when John Hume took probably the biggest risk and spoke to Jerry Adams. That was in 1994. Well, I, I think there was shock across... I mean, in fairness, uh, uh, others will know too, there was some shock within the SDLP who didn't... I think it was around uh, 1988 was the first series of talks, and then again, they, they, they rekindled them in 1993. But some SDLP, including Seamus Mallon, were a little bit worried about what was happening. But to understand the real impact of those talks in unionism, you need to go back three years earlier, Stephen, to the 1985 anglo Irish agreement, unions were still very angry in the back of that. And that's, they did blame. I, mean, I don't want to go to the us and them stuff at this point with, with John's life because it was a huge contribution. But there were people who thought, with, within unionism, who thought that uh, John was particularly significant in persuading the Irish, British and American governments to back 
uh, the Anglo-Irish Agreement to, to, to back something that looked almost like joint authority to Unionists. And then when it looked like Sinn Féin and the IRA weren't going to buy into this, the next thing you discover, or the Unionism discovers, is that uh, John Hume, the, 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 the peacemaker, this leader of, of, of new nationalism, was actually having private talks with Sinn Féin. And don't forget, this is still very angry time. You look at the, I mean, you're talking about young people, how young people see relations. You look at the DUP Sinn Féin relationship now, even telling young people how bad it was between unionism and Sinn Féin 25 years ago before they were born. They just can't comprehend this. And that's why there was that scale of anger. And just one point I think is worth making. Um, I, I didn't really know John all that well. We bumped into each other at a few meetings, but i have written a piece um, for, I think, the newsletter. Uh, we're we'll going back maybe 15, 16 years, maybe a little bit earlier than that, just simply saying, I, I just commented this in the, that, you know, looking back and having been there and observed it and so on, I just wondered if both Trimble and Hume, you know, could have foreseen being eclipsed at the risks they took, that the whole thing could fall apart because the agreement was now in the hands of people who didn't have the same ambition, the same vision, the same willingness to work together. And just at the end of the meeting, just came over, right, like tapped me on the shoulder and said, this, this, I read that piece of yours, and yes, I do worry about that, but we need to keep on ensuring the next generation, the younger generation, the new generation, that if we don't have that vision, if we don't make the willingness to work together, we all lose. And I just, it, it's one of those little things about John. He was... You know, people sometimes say he didn't really understand unionism. I, I, I think that's true. He didn't entirely get it. But I never, ever doubted his commitment to creating a Northern Ireland. And that's the other thing I think is worth saying oh. at the time of the, of the... Just it's worth saying just about the 1998 agreement. I think Hume recognised, as it's Seamus Mallon, this was still going to be a long process in terms of the All-Ireland deal. I think he did genuinely worry that maybe with Sinn Féin eclipsing them, that they were moving far too fast in the direction he didn't necessarily support.